had a pre-submission meeting So I went down to Silver Springs I took documents and drawings And lots of other things They said, go home, boy, wait until the telephone rings. I got the regular toy of blues, about to lose my mind. I'm waiting on some data. No one can seem to find Now my 510k submission Is running three months behind I got a call last week Said they were coming for an inspection Someone down at the hospital Got a real bad infection Now they tell me that I Gotta recall the whole collection Tried to renew my registration I just sent it in the mail Cause every time I went online Their website would fail Now they're putting me in handcuffs And taking me to jail Woo! <laughs> I've been doing this for six years, Bob. That was a first. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thanks very much. So um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about new FDA guidelines, um, some things to think about, some of it from uh, experience and exposure to the industry. And um, we're going to cover two things. We're going to look at the uh, 2017 guidance, some of those in detail. Um, that were issued in fiscal year 2017, uh, some of those impacts and things to think about and learn from. And um, we're also going to kind of take a sneak peek at some things that are coming in this fiscal year um, that we'll also have to adapt to. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is real-world evidence. So this is an, an interesting thing because we, we have FDA, in a very progressive way, starting to understand that every time we bring a new device out, we don't have to do a new trial. There's a lot of data, right? I mean, we're, we're moving toward a whole world of big data. Um, so I think that's a really good thing. But if you, if you look at the, the uh, standard and, and uh, when they came out with it, I kind of actually did an article on this because it's, it's almost talking out of both sides of your mouth. It's sort of saying that, you know, there's, there are situations where we could look at this and we may have data that is, you know, the same as or even better um, than what you could come up with through a trial. But at the same time, nothing is going to change our evidentiary requirements. Um, so that's sort of a, you know, an interesting challenge to deal with both sides of that. But um, I have seen it effective. So I recently talked to um, Stryker, sorry. Um, and it was interesting that they had recently submitted um, a product. And it's, you know, it's heart related. It's for, uh, you know, dealing with stroke. Um, so heart and brain related, dealing with stroke, and in that process, they did not have to do a clinical trial related to the function of the catheter for that specific application, and it was cleared within 30 days. But part of the issue was they had good bench data, they had preclinicals, but they also had real-world data from very similar other applications that they could lean on. So it worked out very well for them and uh, I'm sure others potentially. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something we're gonna have to get used to, you know, which, is, which is a positive. It doesn't mean every device that may be of you know, a, a class two of significant level or a class three is necessarily gonna require a full clinical trial. So 
there's still a lot to learn in testing this, um, but it does seem that uh, they're pretty open to it. So it's, it's certainly something to think about. So for a long time, clinical trials, you know, we, we've not done a good job at all at covering you know, gender, ethnicity, and other, other issues in, in having uh, a good population to represent the end users. And um, they, they put out guidance now really to talk about how they want to see this being different. Um, and it's, you know, I think it certainly is time. Uh, I think we're always a little worried with trials to get a little uh, too involved with different splits of patient population, but, but in the guidance they give us pretty clear guidance, and it's really based on that differentiation, potential risk, potential, you know, different types of, of uh, effects for those different populations. So it doesn't mean you necessarily have to do that, but you have to think about what those effects might be if you're dealing with you know, something different from men and women and how does that work. And they've, some of the examples that they used in the guidance were interesting. There were several studies that had been done for, I think it was for knee implants for a long time, generally the patient population was men. But as women were having them, they were having much, many more complications related to it and after, after you know, being implanted for some time. And they really weren't properly represented in the initial clinical studies related to um, that implant. So it's definitely something that is, is important to think about to cover all of those issues. So um, drug device classification. So this is, um, you know, we're blurring lines everywhere, I think, within the regulatory space. And this is one that has been there for a while. Um, I do think the Office of Combination Products at FDA does a great job. Um, but then again, part of the reason I think is because ultimately it's not their problem. All they're going to do is guide you in the direction to go. And they've been at times where um, I've had the involvement with engaging them, they were extremely helpful. So I think that's, uh, that's a, a real good part of this. Um, but um, in reality, they, they really did try and come through and deal with uh, some of the issues around that specific classification and how should we, um, how should we do that, how do we deal with that. And um, they, they really realized that some previous guidance they had given was going to be problematic, um, related to specifically things around um, chemical action. Uh, they initially had said there can't be any chemical action or it's not a device. Um, and so, you know, they, they've taken those couple of things and really specifically in this, in this guidance backed those things off. And it's, you know, it's good because there, there, were, there were definitely concerns that those things could be problematic. Certainly, if someone gets pushed down um, a drug path and uh, if they're actually a device, that's a, a small part of it. So um, they've kind of looked at um, sort of a better way to determine whether, you know, is that chemical action sort of almost coincidental, um, but isn't the main part of, of how the product achieves its result. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of an interesting piece to look at in trying to understand um, what we have here. So moving forward, the, the pre-submission process, which um, how many folks have been involved in pre-sub? And did you generally find it to be helpful and positive? Yes? Okay, yes, some hands are up. So it's interesting, and, and I wrote about this too, because there seem to be two camps in this. Um, there are folks who sort of see it as a natural follow-on to transparency at the agency and the, the desire to collaboration, uh, toward collaboration uh, in the industry. But um, some folks are just hard set against it. It's like, you know, don't go down there, don't ask them any questions, just, you know, do your best, interpret the regulations and go. But as it gets even more or ever, ever more complex, it's difficult to do that. And so I really think there, you know, there's an opportunity there. Personally, I'm a big fan. Um, prior to doing what I do in writing for MedDevice Online and organizing the content, I was a consultant for seven years and in the device industry for 15 more before that. Um, and I've been there a lot of times. And I think they were all positive. I can't think of anything that went bad. One or two times on, on, on our end, people we were working with and representing didn't do some things that were, were uh, probably the best for their, their, their uh, out desired outcome. But in general, um, it's been a good pro uh, process, I think. But it's interesting, the folks that I generally see not recommending this process are usually folks that are ex-FDA. And I don't know if that's just a small data set, um, but it seems like maybe they've seen the inside and they're kind of like, don't mess with that, don't waste your time. And I think that's unfortunate because I think there's a lot of good there. Um, and as I said, I think they're, 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 uh, the results have been great. It's important to keep in mind though, right, they give us very clear guidance on what that pre-submission should look like. 
And I think that, you know, a couple of the things that are really important, the device description is critical. You know, you're explaining something new or different, at least, to the FDA. They don't have any frame of reference on, you know, this, you may have been developing this thing for two years, and to you, it's second nature. You really need to describe it well so that they can understand what it is, and they can get comfortable with whatever it is you hope to do. So that part, I think, is really, really key. Um, I think it's also, it's also really important to make sure that you're very good with your specific questions. You know, don't go down and ask them, you know, what kind of clinical trial do, should we have for this? I mean, we can all guess what the answer to that would be, right? I mean, there'll be so many sites and so many patients that we can't afford it. Um, so it's, it's important to frame that carefully. Do your homework. Come up with a reasonable plan. You know, we think if we have three sites and we have 30 patients at each site, that we can demonstrate the, the intended outcome that we want for this product. Do you agree or disagree? It's always important to put those into a yes or no type question. So I think it's a, I think it's a, a process that we're all getting used to. I think there's a lot of value in it. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to hear the continued experience of the group with it. De novo submissions. So these are coming more and more forward. Um, you know, there were times, this has been around for quite some time, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, they were getting maybe, you know, 10-ish a year. And the general word on the street was just stay away from it. It's just a, you know, it's just a wormhole. You're gonna get, you're gonna get lost in the process. But the idea is that, you know, if we have something that's, that's not classified, it's, we don't really know where it belongs, you know, it's an automatic class three. But there are devices that are clearly not major risk. They're, you know, they're minor or moderate risk. And so this is the way to do that. It's a little bit quicker in theory. Um, FDA is, you know, trying to say with, with uh, Madufa they'll get them done in 150 days and working the percentage of them being done that way up over the next five years, uh, which is, you know, I, it's, it's a good effort uh, to do that much better than having to go down the PMA path if it works for you. Um, so they put that guidance out and it's, um, you know, I, they, they give some, some guidance there about what to have in that submission. And um, it's, 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 it's important to pay attention to these things, right? I mean, they don't do it for, for no reason. And it is a newer process. But the numbers are coming up. You know, sometime into the, you know, 2010-ish time frame, we were getting toward uh, 25 a year. And you're actually starting to, when you get the list of, you know, recent clearances, or I get a lot of um, press from people that, hey, you know, we got our new device released and they want uh, med device online to cover it. You know, there actually now are some de novos that are coming in and they were kind of under the radar, I think, because they happened infrequently. So, uh, you know, a new pathway and important to keep, uh, keep an eye on that. So breakthrough devices, um, they've kind of unified here. We had uh, some different access pathways in the past. Um, we've had uh, various things, but they've kind of laid this out and explained it, um, which I think is was necessary. You know, how can we use this? I've seen a lot of people wanting to get in the program, obviously, because it gets quick attention and rapid response, um, and that's good in two ways, right? As, as uh, we were talking earlier here, that the idea is that um, you want to help people, and you know, a, a company wants to get in business. Um, so I put up a couple examples there. Um, these, these actually were cleared um, through the expedited access pathway, which is now replaced uh, by breakthrough. Um, but they are, you know, it is happening. And it is, uh, you know, I think, like I said, it's good for, for uh, patients everywhere, uh, and it's good for the businesses. But it, it has to truly be that type of need that really is um, going to do some, some very necessary things and, and help folks. So uh, certainly a good, a good thing to have. So submissions including cybersecurity, we're all you know, very aware of, of a lot of the things that are going on. The incident recently in Atlanta um, caused a lot of concern just on the commercial side. Uh, but you know, we all worry about those types of things in the medical device space. So here, um, they've really just kind of given us guidance of what they are looking for. And so that really means that you, you need to evaluate your product or system's vulnerability. Understand what risks there are and what things you're going to do about it. Um, and the interesting thing is it doesn't end there, right? They really want you to discuss how will things be updated over time because we know software changes all the time and is easily changed. Um, but you have to think about now this impact as well as the functional impact that it could have. So they've given some really clear guidance of what they want to see when that is a part of your product. And the big thing is, right, they, they want to see that you are thinking about that part of the product. If it's connected, as so many devices are today, 
um, we really need to think about potential cybersecurity threats. Medical device accessories for a long time have been an interesting challenge, right? I mean, it was if you're an accessory to a device, then you're a device, and you're the same class as the device you are connected to. But they've really come out and sort of turned on that a little bit. And I think that's actually a real good thing for industry because they're trying to look at the accessory on its own merit. So what really is this thing doing? And, and I can think when I, when I saw this, the first thing I thought of was um, the, the simple example of a respiratory mask. The, the mask is typically and traditionally been classified by what it is used with. It's not used by itself, you know, but it can be used on a CPAP to help somebody. It could be used on a ventilator that is helping to keep them alive. And so what happens there? It depends on what your use is, and it can be a class two, it can be a class three. So it's those kinds of things that kind of make this, I think, important to be able to consider it on its own and not connect it to the device. You need to evaluate its risk level and how it could potentially interfere with the function of the device. But um, it's nice to see them open that door for us as well. So those are kind of the key pieces there. We'll do a quick uh, look forward here relative to um, what I called coming distractions. So these are the 2018 um, draft guidance documents. The interesting thing is the list of draft um, is for next or this fiscal year is much longer than the ones for final. Um, and they're kind of specific and complicated, the ones that will be final guidance. Um, but I won't, I won't read those to you. You can obviously see them. But um, a couple of quick comments on them. The um, third party review has been bandied about for quite some time. Um, the, program's been around for 20 years, more. Um, they did put out some guidance in 2016, but they're coming back around, and it was draft. They're coming back around next year to visit it again. So I don't know exactly what the, the B is in their bonnet, but that one seems to be um, something that's staying there. They're, uh, they're going to actually, uh, again, come around with uh, the uh, pre-submission. They're going to talk more about QSA, probably give us more direction on it. So I think that's uh, interesting as well to look at. Um, Abbreviated 510K, which is, uh, has not been used a whole lot except by companies for a very simple follow-on product. Um, so all of these things are, I think, important and, and things to be aware of, to stay on top of. And I know everybody's already got a full plate, but it's definitely uh, an important thing that uh, we do that. So I'm going to draw it to a close there. That's the, the end of what I had to present and the end of my time. Well, I have a question for you. Oh, oh. And this is a way for us to help you. As editor of Med Device Online, I suspect that you love scoops and good content. Yes, I do. I suspect some of you here in the audience have good content to share that you'd like some uh, visibility on Med Device Online. Show of hands. Meet the editor. <laughs> Bob, thank you very much. Let's hear from Bob. Bob.